Hey guys, Jamie here. Um, I've got this week's teaching topic, which is about love. Um, and, well, love is an interesting word because in daily use, it could be used all the time. Um, people say, I love you to other people. They might say, I love this weather. I love biking. I love this food that I'm eating. Uh, in fact, just the other day, uh, our three-year-old, Juniper, she had a Pop-Tart for the first time, and her response to that when we asked her was, I love this all day. Maybe a little concerning. Um, but when it gets into love as it regards the church or us as individual believers, uh, well, the the concept of love gets a little more complicated, and I'm sure... If we looked, we could probably find thousands of sermons on the topic of love and the church. So my goal here is not to, you know, wow everyone with some great new teaching about love, um, but instead to maybe refocus us a little bit on some of the basics of love. Um, and so in that regard, I've got kind of two main topics here. One is what the Bible says about love and what that means for us as believers. And then secondly, what the concept of love means for God and our relationship with him. So to start us off, I'm going to read through uh, 1 Corinthians 13, and hopefully you'll be able to follow along. So 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body over to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So then what does the Bible say about love and what does that mean for us as believers? So a good exercise here is to take um, verses like verse 4 and 5 that we just read where it has a list of things that love is not and then to take those and turn them around. So I'll just read it again. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. So if we take all of those statements of what love is not and we flip them around, we get a bit of a paraphrase, uh, which I'll state here. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is being happy with what you have. Love is thinking of others first. Love is being humble or meek. Love is bringing others honor. Love is seeking out the needs of others. Love is being peaceful or joyful. Love is letting go of what others may have done to us or what we may perceive that they have done to us. And on top of all of this, I'll just add in um, another verse. This is 1 John 4.18, which says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. 
So on top of all those other things that love is not, it is also not being fearful. And so what we get from these verses is that though love is often used to describe a feeling or a state of being, um, as regards us as believers in Jesus, love has a lot more to do with how we act towards others, how we act towards them, how we address them, how we think about them. And this gives us a good opportunity for a little homework, um, although it's in reality something that I should be doing, that everyone should be doing all the time, and that is as we go about our our day-to-day -day routines, as we go places, as we encounter people, as we run errands, um, to keep track of the way we love or do not love others through our actions. You know, are, are we being humble and meek in our actions towards others? Or are we putting ourselves first? Um, and the big one is at the end here, uh, where it says, you know, love keeps no record of wrongs. And that's a hard one because we all get wronged all the time. You know, it could be by people we know, it could be by institutions, there's all kinds of things that could wrong us. And to let that go, apparently, is love. Um, and how often do we actually put that into practice? I know that's very hard for me. So moving along, um, I've got another verse here, Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So these verses are interesting because they have this list things to put on, you know, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. And a lot of those we see or saw in the earlier verses as kind of definitions of what love is. But at the very end, it says, and above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So while those things may be definitions of love, you know, love is kind, love is meek, love is compassionate, love is putting others first, you also need love for those to work. So really the picture that that's painting is love is an entire package. These attributes are all part of a whole. And this makes sense then when we read 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Uh, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love but the greatest of these is love. Um, and so it raises the question then, so if I, if I say that I'm loving, and I say that, well, I'm kind and compassionate, um, but, I'm, but I'm a little fearful, or I'm a little arrogant, or, or something like that, well then, is that love? And you could make the argument that no, if any part of this package of attributes that is love is missing, then it's, it's not really love. And um, if we go back to 1 Corinthians uh, 13, verses 1 to 3 again, and read through those, um, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And in light of what we've read about love, these verses are a little bit sobering because, you know, they say all these, these lofty things in the church that people would aspire to, speaking in tongues, prophecy, giving to the poor, and they basically say if you don't have love as you do these things, these things are kind of worthless. But when we think about the idea that love is a package of attributes, you know, what if, I, what if I give to the poor, but I feel superior to them while I'm doing it? What if I, you know, have the gift of tongues, but because of that, I feel arrogant? You know, then you could argue, well, those, those things are not being done in love at all then. You know, and if they're done without love, they're kind of worthless. So definitely a sobering 
thing to think about and I guess a reminder that we need to be vigilant, especially as we um, aspire to, you know, have any of these gifts in the church that we have to make sure that they're done with absolute love or else they, they really have no value. So in terms of what the Bible says about love and what that means for us as believers, here's a bit of a summary. Love is an action, but it is also a way in which we carry out our actions. Love is the thing that binds together the rest of our Christian attributes and maybe even makes them possible at all. Now, I know the things that I've said have been um, a bit heavy, you know, all this talk about, well, we have to show love, but if you're missing any element of love, then, you know, are you really loving at all? And I think this really just reflects the reality of our walk as believers and as followers of Jesus, uh, the fact that we can't do any of this on our own, and it really is too heavy for us. Um, so that brings us into the final Thing I wanted to talk about, which is what love means for God and our relationship with God. And um, I'm going to read 1 John 4, 7 to 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So there's a couple of important things here. Um, firstly, though we have this seemingly massive task of loving others all the time and showing all these different attributes of love all the time, we actually have the greatest example in front of us. Uh, in verse 9, it says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. Um, and so, yes, God asks us to show compassion to others. He asks us to be meek and humble. He asks us to be patient. He asks us to honor others above ourselves. But he already did all of that and more for us through Jesus' coming and death and resurrection. So we are certainly not without a very great example to follow. The second thing I noticed at the very end in verse 12, it says, If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And I've read that verse before, but I didn't really notice it. And it's interesting because as God abides in us, his love is more perfected in us. But it also says we also have to love one another. So as we love, as we love one another... God abides in us more, and he helps us to love more. And as we love more, he helps, he abides in us more. And it goes on and on, and it's kind of a cyclical thing, which is, you know, very common in our, our walk with God. As, as he gives to us, we give back, and he gives more, and we give back, and it, it grows and it grows. Um, so I guess, yes, love is very big thing and the challenge of loving others is immense but but the encouragement is that God though he asks us to do this he's right in there with us helping us to grow in our love but also giving us examples and um, I guess encouraging us on a daily basis to love like him so that really wraps up everything I wanted to say about love and I, I hope someone is able to take something away from this. Um, but yeah, that's all I have. So I hope everybody has a good week, and I hope to see you all soon.